and that you are good. Thank you that we can call on the name of Jesus and receive breakthrough and deliverance. And we thank you, Lord, for this. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Well, preaching saints in Jesus' name. Wonderful to see you all this morning. Thank you, worship team. And before I share, I just want to quote Juliet up. And um, there's something that she wants to share with us. Thanks, Juliet. that I really wanted to share, but yesterday God told me I had to share. I had to expose the things that I would like to just keep quiet. Now and I've always believed in healing, and a verse that has always come to our attention is, when the Son of Man comes, will he find persistence and faith on the earth? And the passion says, persistent faithfulness. Sorry, and um, the NLT says, when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth to have faith? And we've always said, God, we want to be one of those that are, um, that are in faith when you come. And have, as a result, we've encouraged many people going through their crises to hold on and to trust God. Um, we've done it in various ways, but to me, I've been such a healthy person that I've never had to apply it to myself. Um, but last year, I started noticing changes, things that weren't right, and eventually the family persuaded me to visit our doctor, and he dies, diagnosed me as having Parkinson's, which is a long-term debilitating disease and is incurable by the medical profession. So I went to God. Obviously, it's a bit of a shock when you get something like that, especially as I have a brother-in-law who I've watched for 17 years get worse and worse. And the verse that God gave me was, Simon, Simon Peter, listen. Satan has asked excessively that you be given up to him out of the power and keeping of God, that he may sift you like rain. But I have prayed especially for you, Peter, that your own faith and I just I found that really good. First of all, I found it an awesome privilege that God would let me be trusted to be sifted. And then to hear him say that I pray for you, that your faith don't fail. That's kept me since then till now, up with, through the ups and the downs. It's kept me saying, you are praying for me. And he is, he's praying for us all the way through in all our different things. Then I've written all the things that God's talked to me. I, 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 you know, when you go through hard times, that's when God comes more and more alive to you, if you turn to him and seek him. So he gave me this from the message, 2 Colossians 2, 6 to 7. My counsel for you is simple and straightforward. Just go ahead with what you've been given. You receive Christ Jesus the Master, now live him. You're deeply rooted in him, you're well constructed upon him, you know your way around the faith. Now do what you've been taught. School out, quit studying, studying the subject and start living it. And let your living spill over into thanksgiving. And that thanksgiving word is very important to me because when you're in a crisis, what are you going to thank God for? The crisis. But boy, there's so much you can thank for even if you don't want to thank for the crisis. And then one of the verses he took me to was Job. Then Job arose, we know what happened to Job. He arose, he raised his leg, robe, he shaved his head, and he fell down upon the ground and worshipped. That is so hard, but so powerful. And all through the Bible you'll find God, when, whenever people prayed, praise God, he came through for them. Mm. And so it's like, worship me. Worship me in your depression. Mm. Worship me in whatever you're facing. Mm. There's so much we can worship you for. The next verse God told me was, have faith in God constantly. And I wrote this. Believe when it is granted, when you pray, not when you see the leaves turn brown. My part is to believe. 
God's part is to respond to my belief. Okay, so as I've mentioned, I've had my ups and downs. Sometimes my faith has failed and I've got depressed and I've got other things when I've seen different symptoms come. But last week, I went into more of a panic because dementia is linked to Parkinson's. And that was like when I heard that. I, 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 that not, I can cope with debilitating, but not with, park, uh, with dementia. And I started last week having black spots when I just couldn't remember. And fear set in, and I woke up on Sunday morning and I said, Lord, I'm fearful of this. And he prayed for me, and after he prayed me, he reminded me, we have the mind of Christ. So I decided right then and there that I need to look at some of my scriptures. I do lots of putting different themes of scriptures together. So I opened one of the script that could be the themes I've done on the mind. And this verse just threw out at me, and it's a verse I don't know. I have recorded it, but I don't know it. It's Proverbs 15, 15. All the days of the desponding, or the depressed, or whatever, and afflicted, listen to this, they are made evil by anxious thoughts and forebodings. And I said, oh God, I'm sorry. I am getting anxious thoughts and forebodings. Mm. Take my place, but it goes on. He said, but he who has a glad heart has a continual feast, regardless of circumstances. Wow. That's the amplified. Then Ken spoke at church and thank you. That was for me, it reminded me all over again to take the word of God, declare it, speak it. And I've been saying to people, I believe healing, and they say yes, yes. And it hasn't meant anything too much to me um, in that I haven't felt anyone come in and say, we'll believe with you. I mean, I, I'm generalizing it. There have been people like the leadership who have really backed me. So I mean, I've been really working through this week, declaring I am healed when I just don't feel I can cope, declaring his strength in whatever verse God has given me at that moment. And then on Saturday, I was clearing up and I found a piece of paper that my daughter had written a verse on for another circumstance a long time ago. And it's passion for Psalm 56 verse 4. With God on my side, I will not be afraid of what comes. The roaring praises of God fill my heart. And I will always triumph as I trust his promises. And then yesterday he told, told me another verse. And that one was good. Because it was basically that um, if we, it's all about salvation, but God wasn't saying that to me. He says, well, with the heart a person believes, adheres to, trusts in, and relies on Christ. And so is justified and declares righteous and acceptable to God. And with the mouth, he confesses, declares openly, and speaks out freely his faith and confirms his salvation. And I read it and I turned away. And God got me back to it and I turned away. And eventually I listened and I said, God, are you really meaning that I must now start telling people what I'm believing for, even though most people battle? <coughs> To, um, to walk in divine health, I think. I've got my brother on the who says get to the doctor very fast, take the pills, and all that sort of thing. And then I am taking the pills, but I'm trusting God. Um, and so I've got people close to me that obviously think the same way Lana and I do. And so basically where I'm at, and why I'm sharing this is to say, I am sticking out. I am going to be like Shadrach, me and let me go. Even if he doesn't, I won't stop trusting. Amen. But he is able. Amen. But the last one that God said to me is, I want you to not be Abraham. I want you to be Abraham. Even if you go on waiting and waiting and waiting like Abraham. So I'll be in the Abraham and you can watch me and see what God does. Thank you, thank you so much, Juliet, for being vulnerable and obedient to the Lord. Saints, we want to stand together because we're one body with Juliet.
and let's blitz this in prayer and trust God for healing, trust God for deliverance from this sickness and any negative diagnosis by the doctors because we know God does heal and He can heal. So saints, as a, an act of faith, stretch forth your hands if there are a few elders want to come in and let them say, yes, welcome, welcome to you. And we're going to believe God, saints, for His strength, for His grace, and for His healing together. Father, we thank You. Thank You, Lord, for Julia, she is Your child. You are the author and the finisher of her faith. And yes, You have prayed for her and You are praying for her. Thank you that you are her healer. Thank you, Lord, that there is nothing you cannot heal. And thank you that your grace is ever sufficient for every situation and struggle. Thank you that your joy is her strength. Thank you that she can do all things through you who gives her strength. And Father, we ask boldly, we step out as children. We can ask you, healing is the, the children's bread. And Father, we ask you, heal Julia. We come against this Parkinson's disease. We come against any diagnosis of possible dementia. Because you have given her a spirit of a sound mind. And so, Lord, we pray for healing in every layer of her being. In the name of Jesus. Father, we promise to give you all the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you. Praise the Lord. And we're called to stand together as a body. But... To be able to have people stand with you, you have to be ready to be vulnerable. And that takes maturity and obedience. And we're thankful for that. And we stand and we're going to trust God. And today, saints, we're continuing with the series entitled, Listen to Him. And today is part three, and we're talking about Jesus Christ, the true vine. And in the book, we've talked about how God, as Saint Jesus, is the ultimate voice of God on the earth. He is the ultimate and only mediator between God and man. And it's only through Jesus that we can understand the context of God's word, Old and New Testament, the prophecies, the prophets, everything. And Jesus is God's representation and God's voice to us above all else. And today I'm going to read from the book of John chapter 15, verse 1 right through to verse 20. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the God. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he trims clean, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands, and remain in His love. I have told you this, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends, for everything I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. They persecuted me, 
they will persecute you also. They obey my teaching. They will, also, they will obey yours also. <coughs> Praise be to the Lord for his wonderful and precious <coughs> What a passage full of meaning and truth and we cannot possibly exhaust everything that the Lord shares in that passage. But I believe it really bears significance to what God wants to say to us today. And the series that we're teaching when he's saying, listen to him. God said on the Mount of Transfiguration, this is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. And we need to listen to Jesus and that's what we're exploring. What does it mean to listen to him? And in this passage, Jesus uses a specific imagery where he says, I am the true vine, you are the branches, and my father is the gardener. And obviously when Jesus talks about the vine, that is a very significant imagery, particularly for the Israelites who were listening at that time, because the vineyards, vineyards were very common, and grape farming was a, quite a common thing. And one of the things that a person didn't want to have was what they called the wild vine, which could actually take over the vineyard and destroy the crop. It would look good initially, but the fruit thereof was very bad. And that's why even the father had said himself in the book of Jeremiah that we should not be like a wild vine, talking about people who go after idols. But then Jesus says, look, I'm not a wild vine that doesn't bear fruit and that takes over the good vine. I am the true vine that bears the fruit that the Father loves. So Jesus is saying that I am the authentic standard of how to please God and how to know God. And he is the vine and we are the branches. And that means that first of all Jesus is the source of all spiritual life. And he is our connection to the Father. He makes very clear a structure. The branches need the vine, but the vine doesn't necessarily need the branches. And Jesus is laying out the order. We need him to be able to know God. We need Jesus Christ to be able to understand spirituality. He is the source of our sonship. The Bible says for those who believe in Jesus Christ, they are called sons of God. Whether you're male or female, we're all sons of God because our DNA is that of God's son. He is the source of our DNA. He is the source of our spiritual network, our connections. It's the vine that determines how the branches are connected and work together. And so Jesus is the one who determines, or at least should determine, how we relate to the world and how we relate to other people. He is the vine, we are the branches. Jesus must dictate and determine how we relate to our spouse, how we relate to our leaders how we relate to our children, how we relate to the government. How he is the source of the pattern of the network. So if we are saying and we are believing that Jesus is the vine and we are the branches, then the way we relate to all these different spheres must be dictated by him. Are we treating our spouse with the love that we should and the respect that we should as Jesus would have us? Are we relating to the church? with the love and forgiveness and service and humility that Jesus would dictate? Or are we choosing to let our flesh instead affect our networks and the way we relate to one another? And we have to make a choice. Is Jesus controlling our network, who we respect, who we bring close, and whom we shun? The Bible is very clear that do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. But sometimes we yield to social pressure. And what happens, and they tell us, no, you should do this, people who want us to take substances and engage in sexual immorality. And we know it displeases the Lord. And we hide under the term of being accepted. But the Bible is very clear. We should choose who Jesus wants us to choose and separate ourselves from whom he wants us to separate ourselves from. We are the branches, not the vine. Again, this is very important. We need to have things in the right order. Jesus is our Lord and our Savior. Yes, He calls us friend. Yes, He is our Savior. But He's also our Master. And we are to submit to Him. Even when He doesn't feel like it. And we have to be very careful in this world we live in today. The philosophies of man have taken over 
and are trying to take over even more and more and they talk about wokeness as progressiveness and comes from the term being awake but those who believe in wokeness I tell you have never been more asleep more in a drunken stupor more deceived and out of it than ever <coughs> there is such deception about sexuality about spirituality there's many ways to worship and there's many forms of sexuality that is false that is wrong that is retrogressive and now if you're progressive then you need to embrace things like homosexuality it's not progressive because homosexuality, homosexuality was there 3,000 years ago and it was associated with nothing but chaos and God's wrath came so it's not a new thing it's not a progressive thing but they talk about wokeness and progressiveness but if we are to be grafted into the vine constantly we need to acknowledge that he is the vine he determines he defines us and we are to submit our philosophies to him and that takes me to the next thing is we are called to remain in him at all times and so when we come to jesus christ the call is not only to turn and to convert but just as critical it is to remain and Jesus actually says in this passage the one that does not remain in me is like a branch that withers is cut off and is thrown into the fire he doesn't say that the one not the one only who doesn't turn to me but he says the one who does not remain and when he talks about a branch being cut off withering thrown into the fire he's talking about eternal judgment so Jesus is saying that hellfire is not only a possible danger for those who do not receive it, but also for those who come but then don't remain Amen. and just as strong as the call is to turn to Jesus equally strong is the call to remain in Jesus to continue to trust him to check your faith do you believe the things you believed first when you came to Jesus? Or are you now like the clergy in Europe, where many of them don't believe many of the things that the Bible says, but they're clergy. They go to church, they hold services or masses or what you call it. Many of them don't even believe the virgin birth. Some of them don't believe the resurrection. But they're clergy. And you can be sitting in church, but not believing essence of God's word that Jesus is the only way to the Father he came in the flesh he lived a sinless life he was fully man yet fully God at once and he died in your place and suffered died in your place and was raised by the Father on the third day and because of that when you trust in that you are saved and you're washed from your sin the inherent sin that came from your ancestor Adam and your own sin because of what you do you still believe those things because you must remain in the faith and this is the challenge that the Lord gives us and this means that Jesus is to be the standard when we must not wander off from him because we can wander off in different ways one of the ways we can wander off from the vine is by pride and self-assurance and presumption where because we feel we know God we stop depending on him and his word and we start focusing on our own ability and using the gospel for our own advantage or convenience only so for instance Jesus assured the disciples that they will be persecuted he talked about two things that we need to keep in balance persecution and authority he said if they persecuted me they'll persecute you and if they listen to me they'll listen to you and people only focus on the one side of the authority that comes from Jesus Christ but he said you will be persecuted and there is a persecution that can and often does come in different ways and many people throw their toys out of the cot and get angry with God when persecution comes up in various forms yet he never promised that life is going to be perfect on earth yes he does give us grace to face any storm so that it will not rob us of our faith but we must be careful that we don't wander off because of our own pride and we feel God owes us we may wander off because of a sense of religion rut and routine and we begin to take God's presence for granted 
and we no longer depend on Him. And we feel that because we know so much Scripture and, and uh, we've served the Lord so long, we lose that sense of daily dependence on Him. Many years ago, I think it might have been 30 or more years back, there was a group that arose that called themselves the, the Bereans. And um, I'm, I've heard Paul talk about this, and he's, he knows much more about this. And their initial intention, I think, was good, because they wanted to keep the church focused on the biblical order of how to do church and how to do things. But they became so absorbed in their own prideful sense of knowledge of God's word, because they would come to a service and they would correct, and they say, no, you shouldn't do things like this, and they will disrupt services. And instead of leaving a lot of positive fruit, they left more wounds. Because they became so self-assured in their religion, in their knowledge of the Logos, the written word, they didn't bear fruit. And we have to be careful, saints, that we don't become so focused on the things we've learned, we lose dependency on God, and we become prideful, and we lose accountability. And we become the standard, instead of Jesus remaining the standard of truth and righteousness. Sometimes we get wander off from the vine, by allowing condemnation and regret to rule our hearts when we've messed up and we've failed before God and perhaps you see that you're not bearing the fruit, so to speak, as the Bible talks about, and then you become so absorbed in self-condemnation. And you may think that it's an act of humility. It's not. It's actually an act of stubborn pride and rebellion. If you find yourself struggling with condemnation, you're actually despising the blood of Jesus. Why? Because the blood of Jesus, once you come, the Bible says, He cleanses you of all unrighteousness. If you confess your sins before Him, sincerely, the Bible says in 1 John 1, verse 5 to 9, that He is faithful and just and will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So how dare you doubt that and keep confessing the same sin over and over again? Now, yes, if you commit the sin again, you do have to bring it before Him. But if it's, it's happened 20 years ago and you think of it and then you keep saying, sorry, Lord, that's not being humble or religious, that's being very stubborn and rebellious and prideful. Mocking the blood of Jesus. Because it's able to cleanse you. Jesus said you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. You want to be clean from a bad habit, you want to be clean in your conscience. You might have done certain things that you regret like an abortion, or adultery, many other things. What will clean you is only taking God's word and what Jesus said, allowing that to wash you, confessing and saying, Lord, I'm sorry, and allowing him to wash you with his word, which says, if you believe in me, I will cleanse you, I will wash you, I am making you. So let us not wander off from the vine. And then that takes me to the title slide, listen to him. That's what we're talking about in this series. God is calling us to listen to Him, to remain in Him. And how do we remain in Him? How do we listen to Him? Number one, Jesus tells us in this, is making sure that His Word remains in us. And this is quintessential sense. It's important that His Word, what He has spoken in the Bible, and how He speaks to us and confirms that Word by His Holy Spirit, that we deliberately choose to focus on imbibing His Word? Do we take time to feed ourselves of His Word? We often take time to feed our body, eat in the morning, in the afternoon. We take time to wash our body, take a bath and take a shower. At least I hope you do, even in this morning. But we need to be just as deliberate in feeding our spirits with the Word of God. Having a specific time helps. When you wake up in the morning, and you will hear me always talk about this, I believe in a principle I call the good news before world news principle. Before you hear what the world is saying, take time, even if it's just five minutes, to get into the Word of God. Speak it out now. Speak it over yourself. Speak it over your family. Speak it over this nation. And then get into other things. Prioritize His Word. The second thing, that helps us to remain in Him is obedience. When you see what He says in His Word, what He says about all sorts of things, do you obey His Word? Do you walk in the Holy Spirit? Do you obey Him when He tells you to walk in love? Do you obey Him when He tells you to forgive? 
Do you obey him when he tells you to walk in spiritual purity and not to entertain demonic things? The Bible talks about how we must not participate in the table of demons. And sometimes you have many people in the church who come to church but participate in things that go against the gospel of Jesus Christ. For instance, particularly among many of the African people, people engage in African traditional religion and they have rituals at the gravesite. And that is demonic. And they call upon the ancestors. And actually it's not ancestors they're calling, it's demons that pretend to be ancestors anyway. And if you are abiding in him, then you must obey him and not participate in that. Sometimes people engage in things like tarot cards and play with Ouija boards and all these games and the occult. Now if you are to remain in him, you must shun that. Sometimes there are things that are passed down, people are taught like Freemasonry and secret societies, which have a parallel meaning, and then go against your faith and things that have to do with the New World Order and all these things. Now if you are to abide in the van, you have to be circumspect. Are these things that you're doing pleasing to him? If they're not, then you must obey. That's how you remain in the vine. You deliberately obey. The third way to listen to him and to remain in the vine is to walk in sacrificial love. Sacrificial love for one another, starting, starting with the body cascading outwards to the world and the lost. Sacrificial love. Where you speak the truth in love, even if you're going to be looked upon like a fool. But you're going to love the body enough to speak the truth and say, brother, the way you're going is not going to help you. Perhaps you can help them not only by chastising them, perhaps there's something you can give to them and they're struggling. And you've got a little bit to help them along. And you say, brother, sister, you're struggling, but take this. And you help them sacrificially. Doesn't mean that you have the world to give, but what you can. For Christ's sake. And you do that. Walking in sacrificial love. Committing yourself to fellowship and to missions. Doing your part. We're not all necessarily called to be evangelists, but you can do something. You can contribute, you can encourage or support someone who's doing it. You can pray for those who are going out. You can point out and draw people, bring them to church and let the pastors and the elders deal with them once you draw them in. But you can do something as an act of love. And this is how we remain in. And this ultimately, which takes me to the last slide, will enable us to bear fruit, lasting fruit. And God wants us to bear lasting fruit. Jesus wants us to bear lasting fruit. And this is quite interesting, it's very critical that we keep this in our minds. But the mark of discipleship, the thing that truly shows that you're born again, it's not necessarily you saying the sinner's prayer. It's not necessarily your level of attendance. Though we want you to attend church, it's good to attend church and home group and all this, it helps you grow. But that's not necessarily what shows that you're a believer, not to God. It's not even how much scripture you recite. Even though that is important to recite scripture and share scripture with people, the one thing that God looks at to say, this is my child, is fruit. The fruit that manifests in terms of your character and your impact upon other people. You may say the sinner's prayer well enough and it's important to confess and agree with God verbally. You need to do that. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're saved. It's the fruit in your life. How you treat other people. How you think daily. How you prioritize your day. And I'm talking about things that you do naturally, not things that you try to force. Your inclinations. Because God wants us to do things from the heart. Because when you want an apple tree, the most logical thing to do is you plant the seed. Think about how ridiculous it would be that someone has a lemon tree, and then they think, oh, I want to make it an apple tree, then they look for apples, buy apples at honeydew, and then they tie the apples onto the lemon tree. That doesn't make it an apple tree. So when you're talking about fruit, it's not trying to force yourself. If you find that it's, it's, a, it's constant drudgery to serve God, it shouldn't be drudgery. Yes, sometimes it's hard, but your internal inclination must increasingly be to please God. You must find yourself wanting to please Jesus more and more, desiring to walk in forgiveness more and more, desiring to walk in holiness more and more, desiring to obey God more and more and more and more and more. 
from your heart. And then you start to bear the fruit, lasting fruit, the Bible tells us. Not fruit that, not fruit that is entirely into a tree, but lasting fruit that comes from within, where Jesus is expressing himself through you. And this is what he desires. And it's amazing, there's a promise that when we manifest fruit, Jesus promises that when we pray, God will answer our prayers. When we bear fruit. But let me just double click on something before I explain that. Is that to bear fruit, you need to plant the right seed. Because it's so easy to get into striving. Where you say, okay, there's good fruit is, okay, I need to preach more, love more, forgive more, and you try to do it externally. Fruit is a result of intimacy and mix. There's two things that you need to do if you want to bear the fruit in terms of your talent, your thoughts. Number one is plant the word of God in you. Now I'm going to read James chapter 1, verse 19 to 21. James writes and says, My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. So the word of God saves us, washes us, but only if it's planted in you. So the first thing you do if you want to bear fruit, plant the word. And I've already kind of talked about that, committing yourself to studying scripture constantly and speaking it out learning what God says through his word. And the second thing is to spend time in his presence through prayer. Talk to him. Get used to hearing his voice. Share with him how you feel. Even if it, what you are carrying in your heart is negative and you're angry and you want to run to God, it's better for you to run to him than to be quiet and pretend that all things are well. Besides, he can see that negative emotion anyway. And he wants you to say it out so that you can be honest with yourself so that he can help you. But talk to him. Even if it's a few minutes. Sometimes it may be to sing him a song. You don't know what to pray. Well, sing him a song. You don't need to sing in church only. Even though it's wonderful music and singing in this church. But it doesn't have to happen only on a Sunday. Sometimes you can take scripture, the Psalms, read them out to him. You don't know what to pray. Look for Psalms. I have favorite Psalms. I like Psalm 18, Psalm 19. Psalm 37, and read them out who God is. Spend time talking to Him, and the fruit will come naturally. And we need to do this. And then we can have the promise that God will answer us when we pray. And one of the ways He answers us is even in terms of preservation. And the course that we've been advertising for a while, we've started it now, the Free to Go course, where we're teaching and talking about deliverance. One of the things we talked about yesterday was the spirit of premature death. And again, quite a contentious topic, but one of the things we talked about was how life is connected to purpose. Preservation is connected to purpose. That the more you serve God, the more likely it is to preserve you for the sake of doing His purpose. God is not wanting to preserve you simply for you to enjoy life, though He wants you to enjoy it. But there must be a link with the purpose. And even Paul talks about this, I'm not going to read it in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, going down and he talks about his battle, whether he's going to remain on earth or he's going to die. Then he says, because I'm convinced I still need to have fruitful labor among you, he says, I know I will remain. And he had an assurance of God's preservation because he knew there was a purpose for him on earth. And when you walk in God's purpose, then there is reason for you to remain on earth. And if you want to remain on earth, then find the purpose of why you're still here. And if there's a purpose for your existence and you hold on to that purpose, then there will be reason for God to preserve you. Now, of course, we don't want to be obsessed with staying on earth because to be with the Lord is better, as Scripture tells us. But God does want to preserve us for the sake of His purpose. And it's quite interesting in closing, um, a story is told about William Brennan, mighty, mighty servant of God at one stage. And um, he served the Lord, but he began to stray in terms of his doctrine. 
And interestingly enough, you've got prophecies, but I think from two or three different people, that look, God is going to take you if you don't correct your ways. And God did take him in his 60s, the prime of his life and ministry. And that prophecy was fulfilled because he didn't turn. And I, when you see it, you can see why God would take it because his era left a lot of damage. And if he had lived longer, it would probably have been even more damaged because of his rebellion. And our lives on earth are very connected to our faithfulness in purpose. So in summary, I put a diagram there in terms of what the Lord is talking to us about in John 15 as we listen to him. And the first thing is you make a decision to be a disciple in faith. And when you make that decision, it means that you choose also to remain in him. And that's talking about dependency. And when you choose to remain in him, it implies that you choose to walk in love. That's obedience. And when you choose to walk in love and obedience, that will lead to sustained fruitfulness. And that brings purpose and joy. And when you walk in that fruitfulness, that will result in answered prayer. And that means an effective love. What are we saying in essence, saints? Listen to me. That's what God wants us to do. Check the life that you're living. Are you choosing, in spite of pressure, in spite of temptation, you're making a commitment to listen to him. And sometimes you may stumble and fall, but your heart is still in that place where you're saying, Lord, my desire is to please you. Help me. And as the author and the perfecter of your faith, he will help you. Saints, listen to him. Let me pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. Thank you, Lord, that we can have assurance as your children and know that we're walking in purpose and power simply by choosing to listen to Jesus. And Lord Jesus, we declare that you are the true vine. And we are the branches, we're not the vine, we're the branches, and we depend on you. Help us, Lord Jesus, to remain in you through your word, to remain in your love, to walk in obedience, to choose to walk in sacrificial love, to listen to you. Thank you that you're the author and the finisher of our faith, and that we can do all things, including listen to you, through you, Lord Jesus, who gives us strength. In Jesus' name, Father, we thank you. Amen. Bless you, saints. You can have the offering taken. Thank you so much for your giving once again. <laughs>